Hello everybody. Good evening. Good afternoon. Good morning. God bless you. Welcome. Mm -hmm. Hello everybody. Hi everyone. It's an honor to have you here again today. I'm so excited about today. So, so excited. Thank you. Thank you. I love to read your comments. Thank you so very much. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. I'm honored to be serving you today. I'm so grateful to God for the privilege. I bring you greetings from, where am I? Um, Washington. <laughs> Washington, D.C. <laughs> In the U.S. Oh, and today I went to the, to the White House to take some pictures, you know, and all that. It's good to take a break once in a while from everything you're doing. So it's to cheer. School is ongoing. I'm reading. I'm studying. I'm, I'm keeping abreast of what is going on in school. I'm reading my notes. But I'm here in Washington, D.C. Thank you, everybody, for being a part of this today. I see you from everywhere. Uganda, everywhere. Thank you so very much. My opening remark today is something that touches my heart. Tanzania, I see you. If you hang around people who act like you are not who you are, you will soon forget who you are. I'm going to say that through two more times. Thank you. I read your comments and I'm grateful. I'm grateful. If you hang around people who act like you are not who you are, very soon, you will forget who you are. In my quiet time this morning, I was reading the book of Second Chronicles chapter 18. And I read about Jehoshaphat, a man that was so blessed. In fact, that scripture opened up in verse 1 to tell us that he was so blessed. Jehoshaphat had riches. Second Chronicles 18. Jehoshaphat had riches and honor in abundance. But he joined affinity with Ahab. And if you read on, there was a point when Ahab said he should go with him to the battlefield. And hear what Ahab said. I will disguise, you don't disguise. He almost lost his life. Your circle of friends is a prophecy of your future. Be careful who you surround yourself with. Sorry about the noise. I told you I'm in um, Washington. Mm -hmm. If you hang around people who act like you are nothing, who act like you are not who you are, very soon, you yourself, you will forget who you are. Stop hanging around people that demean you, people that belittle you, people that make you feel that you are nothing. People that make you feel small and little. You smell like the company you keep. Your friend is the prophecy of your future. If you hang around people who act like you are nothing, they just treat you anyhow. They talk to you anyhow. They belittle you anyhow. They dishonor you anyhow. Very soon, my dear, you will forget who you are. Somebody is asking me, what if it's his spouse? You need to sit down and talk with that spouse. That's why I keep telling you, be careful who you marry. Because marriage is for destiny. Be careful. You cannot afford to marry someone that treats you as if you're nothing. You need to sit down and have a conversation about this. You cannot continue to live that way. Stop hanging around people who act like you are not anything. Otherwise, you will soon forget who you are. You're not working in pride, not at all. 
But excuse me, you are important. If you hang around people who act like you are nothing, very soon you will forget who you are. <laughs> That's my welcome address today. Somebody is asking me, what about if it's your congregants, your congregation? You need to teach them. And if you can't teach them, you better invite someone that can teach them. And I wonder why you cannot teach them anyway. Hmm. You need to stop hanging around people who act like you are nothing. Otherwise, you will forget who you are. It will shock you that this thing works. Because nothing can start the assault of perpetual thinking. Once you begin to work with people that treat you as if you are nothing, very soon you begin to think that you are nothing. In fact, you will forget who you are. I listened to a lady in London a few days ago and she blessed me so, so much. I featured her before on Navigate with FFA. And I told that I'll be repeating my guests. I brought back my husband. So get ready for other people because they are very, very special and they know what they are doing. Today I have as my guest, Coach Jola Grace Emmanuel. The floor is ours today to just bless us. Yes. Glory. Oh, she's here. Good I told evening, you she Good is. evening, mommy. Hi, Jola. Good afternoon from... From Washington. Good afternoon, from Washington. Good evening from, from London. <laughs> Thank you, Yes, mommy. you're so Thank beautiful. You are. Place. Like I told you a few days ago in London, I never knew that you had so much on your inside. Oh my God, Dr. Jazz. Oh my God, I see my husband, I see Dr. Jazz. This is going to be mind-blowing. God bless you. Good evening, Daddy. Good evening, sir. Thank you, darling. <laughs> okay, so the floor is yours for the next 45, 50 yeah. minutes. Whatever you want to tell us. Wow, I thank you. Thank you ahead. so much, mommy. You know, I just have to first of all say how privileged I am to be sharing this platform with you and how honored I am, you know, for the gift of access that you have given me. And like I fondly call you, you are the chapter one in my journey to freedom. And by the grace of God, as long as God gives me breath and life you know, you will hold that place in my life. Because if I think back as to where I'm coming from and where I am now, there is no way the story of my life can be written without you inside it, mommy. So I'm so grateful. I just want to say thank you. I'll keep saying thank you. I will forever keep saying thank you. I love and I appreciate you so much. And you didn't just help me. You didn't just birth me. You didn't just help me come out of that difficult uh, situation I was in. You you are constant in my life telling me you can do this. You know, what are you doing? I remember back in the days, you know, you would call, you would just leave a voice message for me. Jola, I'm just thinking about you. How are you? I love you. And the funny thing is when those calls come, those voice messages come, sometimes I'm driving, I'm, I'm sad and I'll just pack and I'll just cry and I'll be like, how did she know that I needed that? At this point in time so i'm truly 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 grateful uh mommy i really appreciate it. somebody says there's no volume uh there's volume, no, 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 there's volume. volume. so that. i mean thank you so much uh again once again for this opportunity um i'm a certified life and trauma recovery coach and uh, i help people who have been through trauma to heal and to reinvent themselves for an excellent life and you know a few years ago i had a life-changing uh situation I was in an abusive marriage for 16 years and I was at a place where I was suicidal and attempted suicide and um, my life was was a mess. I didn't feel there was anything, you know, so much to come out of my life. I didn't like myself. I felt I was a problem, you know, in this world. I felt the world would be better without me. And, um, you know, in fact, for 
it over a decade in the relationship i didn't even know i was being abused until i met him and i remember that day was 24th of may that year when you told me jola olati barai i can never forget those words you know that was the first time i realized that okay i am actually being abused and you know for me i felt there was there was no way out i felt this is it i felt i didn't have any option i felt this was it i was going to my life has ended here i made a mistake and that's it but over time i began to realize that i actually have options that there was options that that wasn't the end of my life yes i've made a mistake but that mistake doesn't have to hold me and truncate my life for the for the remaining days of my life you know and by the grace of god my and again by your help which is why i said you are the chapter one in my journey to freedom because i remember on that fateful day when you called my dad you know, there was going to be another incident and I ran out of the house and I called you and you were very angry that I said, it is enough. Is your daddy still alive? Give me your daddy's phone number. And then you ran my dad. My dad is a venerable. And I thank God for, for my dad, that my dad didn't hesitate. My dad didn't use religion, you know, uh, to, to didn't allow religion to override sense, uh, wisdom, you know, and he just said, just be coming home, be coming home, you know, I have no idea this is happening to you, you know, and th that was the beginning of, of my coming out of that relationship, you know, um, I married, well, I said I married quite early, yeah, quite early, yeah, around the, at the age of 24, so I was very naive, you know, I didn't know, I didn't know anything, I didn't know what, uh, what marriage is supposed to be i didn't know what i was supposed to all i knew i think all i knew was submit <laughs> once you are married stay there and submit whatever happens happens you know that's 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 the end you know so for a long time i stayed there i prayed i was told to pray you know i was told to pray i was told to uh just respect more submit more and i did all manner of things i was telling i was sharing last week i said to the extent at a point in time i was i would make food for this person and i would take the food to this person in the bedroom and kneel down to give the person to say okay maybe you know um that's that's a little bit more respect you know i did all manner of things but i wasn't just respectful that was my main offense you know and i i i, I went through different every kind of abuse uh, from physical abuse i was hit i was beaten i was slapped uh to verbal abuse i was called called different kinds of name uh you're stupid you're foolish you don't have sense um nobody likes you you have a problem in my life if you cannot obey my instructions get out of my life you know to 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 gaslighting you know making me doubt my own reality to psychological emotional even financial and even sexual i dare to say sexual because from what i've learned now i mean sex in marriage is supposed to be for two people enjoying enjoying it but when one person just forces themselves on the other person uh then i believe that becomes sexual abuse so i went through all of those for 16 years and by the grace of god and by you allowing god to use you also to be audacious i say i was saying to someone that i thank god for mama that mama was audacious and bold enough because the truth is um when i came out i didn't want to be a christian again um for those people who understand who know what scripture union is that is the way we grew up my parents were scripture union members my dad was an anglican priest you know so we were like brought up in the christian way so me getting married to the person i got married to who i mean who, who was the pastor um, and going through everything I went through, I came out and I was like, if this is God, if this is what God is and church is, I don't want to have anything to do with this Christianity again. I just wanted to be on my own and just figure my life out. But while I was in that place, God also reminded me that, yes, you were hurt by people in the church because apart from the person that I was married to, I had other people around me who were, you know, pastors and everything. They were telling me that, oh, just keep praying, you know, this is well, this one, blah, blah, blah. So I felt very angry and bitter with the church, with the people in the church that told me all of these things, that told me I could not leave. Somebody actually told me that you cannot live without this man. Somebody told me that, you know, because there were times that I tried to run away. But they said, oh, you know, you always, you cannot live without this person. So I felt that that was, that was it for me. Like I was going to just die there. So from all of that, I just felt, mm, I don't want to be a Christian again. But God reminded me that, look, how did you come out of that cage? 
How did you come out of that prison? I thought you were my children. So God said to me that there are good people in this world. There are bad people in this world, but there are also good people in this world. And sometimes you will follow spiritual leaders that will mislead you. You will follow spiritual leaders that will hurt you. That doesn't mean that I am a bad God. And at the early stages when I came out, one thing that God kept telling me was that I'm a good God. I'm a good God. Forget about how somebody represented me to you. Come and know me by yourself. Come and discover who I am by yourself. And that was how my journey started of, you know, getting back to know God and saying, God, yes, it's true. You used your children, you used pastors, you know, to help me and to bring me out as well of that, you know, relationship. And I, as I, I, I started my journey of getting to know God again, getting to rediscover myself. Because at that point, uh, I, I, in my coaching, I talk about esteem. So I talk about low self-esteem high self-esteem and no self-esteem i had no self-esteem at that point in time because of the trauma that i am i have been through i came out of that relationship and i felt there was nothing good about my life even after i exited physically i was still suicidal because it's one thing for you to come out of trauma it's another thing for you to heal because everything that has happened has happened in the realm of your soul so when i talk, when we're talking about emotional wound or a uh, wound that is caused by trauma it happens in the realm of your soul a man is a tripartite being you have a spirit you have a soul you live in a body and your soul consists of your will your mind and your emotions and so when you go through trauma when you get get keep beaten and keep spoken negative words are spoken to you it is forming you it is shaping how you see yourself it gets to a point where you see yourself like as maybe a piece of rotten bread that you don't even have any value you don't have there's nothing about you you look at yourself in the mirror and all you see was ugly people look at me now or now i know that i'm good looking but back then i would look at myself and be like ah look at you are so ugly look at you there was nothing good i, I didn't like looking at the mirror because i i just i just felt disgusted anytime i look at myself and this is because over the years, I've been, I have been programmed to believe that I was rubbish, that I was trash, that there was nothing good about me, that you better be happy that you are in my life, that I'm involving you in the things I'm doing. So I felt that there was, my, my existence was hinged on somebody else. If that person says, you can't breathe, then I can't breathe. If that person says, you can't stand up, then I can't stand up. So I went through everything, uh, cohesive control. I was isolated. I was told I didn't, I wasn't allowed to have relationship with people. And for me, it was just a point where I felt, okay, well, this has happened. Let me just, that, that, maybe this will be, you know, the rest of my life. And I will just, I know that I made a mistake, but perhaps I will die here. But by the grace of God, I came out and I started the journey of rediscovering myself. Um, I was at the point where, I felt, okay, God, first of all, I don't understand where I went wrong. How did I, how did this happen to me? And I wrote a book recently, uh, you know, which you commended, and I'm just so grateful to God again for that. But when I wrote the book, um, I was, I was, the book is Rise Above Your Past. I was very excited. I was making a lot of noise. And people were like, is it not just a book? You know, is it not just a book? And I was like, you guys don't understand. It's not, it's not just a book. It's not just a book because this was somebody, um, when, I, when, I, when I was going through what I was going through, I was clinically diagnosed as I was depressed, like I had clinical depression. So it's not just like, oh, I'm feeling bad. You know, because I say to people that sometimes people, people trivialize other people's emotions and what they're, what they're going through. Um, just going through a rough patch is not, is not depression something happens to you you know say ah you know ah, even if you're living in nigeria you are traumatized though that is not it because look your soul the bible says guard your heart with all diligence for out of it comes the issues of life and when you are attacked when you are abused when you go through trauma it affects your soul where the issue of your life comes from I which above all things are you prosper and being good health even as your soul prospers so that means that the prosperity of your soul is the foundation of the prosperity of 
every other area of your life. If something goes wrong with your soul, <laughs> everything is wrong with your life. And you know, I, I help people understand it better when I say if you look at somebody that has psychosis, um, which in lay terms is somebody that is crazy, you know, or mad, like, like we call it in Africa, if you look at that person, most of the time, there's nothing wrong with the person physically. They're able bodied, they can see, they can, everything is okay with their body. But something is wrong here in their mind, in their soul. And because of that, that person cannot even dress themselves. There's nothing wrong with their hand. But because something has gone wrong in their mind, they, can, they, they will probably wear a, a trouser on their head. They would, you know, they will put shoes on their... Nothing is wrong with their hand. But something has gone wrong in their mind, in their soul. And this person cannot pray. So sometimes you think that was spiritual. This person cannot even pray. So... It is the mind that has problems, but it has affected every other area of that person's being. So I say to people that the worst thing that another human being can do to another human being is to mess up with their soul, to mess up with their mind. And that is what an abuser does. And when I'm talking about abuse, let me just quickly say that abuse is not gender biased. So yes, in my own own case it was a male uh you know came through a male but i've also seen female who are abusers so it's not gender biased and it's, it's, it's not even biased at all it doesn't matter where you live you can say i live in america i live in the uk i live in nigeria it happens as long as there are human beings there and look see god did not create us to be controlled by another human being because it gets to the point the way the abuser starts is that telling you that first of all uh you know they love bomb you they idolize you oh you are this you are that so you feel you are good and then they start devaluing you oh look at you look at your nose it's so long is that the way people's nose are look at your stomach so, so big is this this way you look when i married you uh was it not that I, I had children that my stomach became this big oh look at you you know they just start pulling your esteem down and see i say i, I tell to people that there are five basic needs of the soul so just like as human beings, our physical body, we have needs, you know, we need to breathe, we need to drink water, you know, we need all of this for our physical well-being. Also, your soul needs some things, right? Love is not a want. Our soul needs love. Your soul needs appreciation. Your soul needs attention. Your soul needs, uh, your soul needs care. That is why some Sometimes if you, we are driving on the road and you allow somebody to pass and the person just goes off and they don't say thank you, they don't like, you know, flash their lights or whatever, you become like, ah, nonsense, why can't this person say thank you, <laughs> you know, I, but really think about it, it's not just thank you, it's just thank you, but because your soul needed that appreciation and you didn't get it, you feel a twinge of anger at that point in time that, ah, uh -uh, at least a thank you will have will be okay because that is a need of the soul your soul needs attention so you you dress up and you look good and you're walking you know and you're expecting your friend or your spouse you know or somebody to look at you and say oh you look good and they don't you feel a bit of a, a tinge of anger like can't you you know you just can't you see my hair and when somebody looks at you and say oh you look pretty you know you feel good because these are the needs of the soul so in in abuse all of these things are not there so your soul is getting damaged gradually you are beginning to embody those negative words that has been spoken to you so the, the, the that person has been telling you you are stupid you are foolish you are a problem you start seeing yourself like that so even if you try to say oh i want to write a book or i want to read as you are trying to read you're just hearing stupid because it's registered in your subconscious foolish a problem oh, i'm stupid and foolish i can't read the book i can't do anything right it has been ingrained inside your soul and 99 percent of the things we do is, is is comes from our subconscious so what is ingrained so i say to people your eyes and your ears are the gateway to your soul be careful what you see be careful what you hear so i don't want to go ahead of myself but in your journey to recovery, so I'm, so I'm sure somebody's wondering, okay, so what happened after you went through the abuse? By the grace of God, I came out of the abuse and I started healing. I went through therapy. 
I went through coaching. And that's why I say to people, look, you need to go through coaching, you need to go through therapy. And I believe that the mandate God has put upon my life is to heal the broken heart at this point in time. Is to help people who are going through the same thing that I've been through uh, to heal and to rediscover themselves and to know themselves again, to so understand that they have options. And that is not the end of your life. Yes, you went through that painful, painful patch. But look, the future is brighter. The future is beautiful. If you can make the decision to say, I'm going to rise from my past. I'm going to learn from my past. And I'm going to begin, begin to work in purpose. I say to people that the number one reason why you need to heal is because you are a value carrier. God did not make anybody without anything. He gave you something. But circumstances and situations try to side, side, try to um, cause that thing to die inside your life, to suffocate that thing inside you, and you feel you don't have anything. I felt I didn't have anything for a long time. But in my journey of recovery, in my journey of healing, in my journey of going through therapy, I began to discover myself. One of the things I discovered was that I asked myself, how did I get there? And I realized that I didn't know who I was getting married to. Married to. I only know who the what of the person I was getting married to. So what this person represented. This person was a pastor. This person had charisma. This person was this. This person was that. But I did not know who the person was. Because your who is different from your what. <laughs> and I said, and I said, okay. By the time I started discovering the who of the person, it was too late. I was already inside it. And so for me, I began to say to myself, now I need to discover who I am because I didn't even know who I was. So who are you? You know, I was sharing last week and I was saying, if somebody asks you, who are you? You say, oh, okay, um, I'm a psychologist. I'm a therapist. I'm a coach. I'm a doctor. I'm a pharmacist. And that is not who you are. That is what you are. Because your what is temporary. Today, you might be a doctor. Tomorrow, you might not be a doctor again. Anything can happen. I mean, one day I was first lady, the next day I was nothing. And so I asked myself, okay, so who really are you? Is it all of those things? No, that is not who you are. I have to begin to find out who I was, discover myself, and begin to accept who I am, and begin to walk in that purpose of who I am, because who I am will sustain my what. Whatever what I find myself in, it is the who that will sustain it. And so it is important for you to come to a place where you tell yourself, I need to rise and I need to heal. Because see, if you don't heal from the trauma, some people go through childhood trauma. So what happened to you happened to you as a child? Some people experience rape as children, as a child. And you've not been able to talk about it. You've not been able to discuss it with anybody. You've been carrying that body in your heart for so long. You need to heal. Time doesn't just heal. Being in Tensioner is what heals because see this the wound of the soul is not something that you can see and you can say oh okay uh, you know I was while I was in the relationship and I'm also going to talk about how emotional wound affect us physically but while I was in that abusive relationship I discovered I developed cancer cancer on my shoulder I had three cancerous tumors on my shoulder and um, I went for I had went for the operation came out and all of that. I remember the doctors, I had I had it done here in, in London, Royal Martin Hospital in London. The doctor said, in all of their years, they never removed cancer from somebody's shoulder. I mean, that's the odd place for cancerous growth to be. But as I came out, got certified as a therapist and a coach, you know, and I began to realize that different emotions that we carry on our inside reflect in different parts of our bodies. So if you are having pain on your shoulder, it means you're carrying the burden of a spouse or a child. Mine wasn't just pain. It degenerated into cancerous tumors. So a lot of times we don't, under, we don't understand that we are doing ourselves a disfavor if we don't come to a place that we tell ourselves, I'm going to heal. Because the negative medical research has proven that between 75 to 95 percent of the illnesses and diseases that we carry in our bodies is, is as a result of negative emotions trapped on our inside. The emotion of guilt, in particular, it gives you sleepless night. It gives you irritable bowel syndrome. It gives you constipation. You have digestive issues because you are carrying guilt, and that is 
a burden guilt and shame is a burden that no there's no how you will go through trauma that you will not carry that guilt because your perpetrator will find a way to let you know that it is you it is because of what you did that they did what it what they did what they do for <laughs> to you so they will say to you well it's because you didn't give me food on time that's why i slapped you oh it's because the, it's because you didn't leave money at home that's why i talked to you anyhow in public they will say to you uh, so you were raped they say you see, what did you wear you know what did you wear that's victimizing the victim so a lot of times you are you are carrying the guilt of what happened to you around as if it is my fault all this abuse is my fault and i say to people say look you don't have control over what other people do you have to ask yourself of what I have control over, you have no control over the actions of other people. Somebody can come in front of you and start telling you silly, <laughs> laughing at you, doing all sort of things. You cannot control what they are doing. It is them. The only thing you can control is how you react. So yes, let's even say you really did something nasty, right? It is still not a license for you to be abused. And the way I drive this home is I say, if you're driving your car on the road and there's a driver behind you and this driver is not looking at where they are going, maybe they are playing on their phone or they are talking to somebody and laughing or something and they just hit you from the back and your, your car is, you know, is, is destroyed, is broken, the glass, everything is down. And you just park and you're so angry, you know, and especially if you live in a place like Lagos where they speak the big English, you come out of your car, you're saying, can't you see my car? And then, you know, people will gather. Ah, you too, you are not, it's your fault. You're not looking at where you're going. And so you are angry and you have a right to be angry. Well, the things I say to people in my coaching sessions is that, look, your emotions are valid. And sometimes we invalidate, invalidate our own emotions and we allow other people to also invalidate our own emotions. So it is okay for that person to be angry because somebody has hit your car, it's their fault. So you come down, you might shout on the person, you might da -da -da -da. but if you now go to the person's car, pull the person out of their car and start beating the person, hitting the person, you now strangle the person on the person, that person dies. <laughs> At that point in time, you are no longer the victim. Because you have just committed murder. You don't kill somebody. Why did you kill? Ah, he hit my car. No. If your car does not give you enough reason to kill that person, at this point in time, you that person is going to be arrested and, you know, is going to face, 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 the, 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 uh, face justice. So I see to people that, look, the first thing you need to tell yourself as a victim, no matter whether it's childhood trauma, you can actually that trauma as a child, as a spouse, the abuse could have happened in your, in your place of work because that also happens. People go through abuse in their places of work. The abuse might have happened with a, a relative or even in a spiritual organization, whatever, wherever that abuse happened, the first thing you need to tell yourself is the abuse is not my fault. I know it's hard. I, I, I remember one client that I had one day and I asked the very first session I said to, to the lady, I said, the abuse is not your fault. And she cried for 20 minutes. I said, I understand. I've been there. I absolutely understand what you're feeling because they say to you, it's your fault. It's what you did. It's what you didn't do. So you believe that everything that happened, but look, the abuse is not your fault. That person chose to behave the way they wanted to behave. It has nothing to do with you. So you need to first of all remove that from your mind and tell yourself, no, I'm not going, I'm not going to carry this guilt and this burden because it's it's doing me in is injustice to me. Because when you sit in those negative emotions of trauma, you begin to have panic attacks, you begin to have anxiety, you have insomnia, you can't sleep, you look at yourself in the mirror, you'd hate yourself, you don't like yourself. You can start also having suicide ideation, thinking that the world is better without you. And then your esteem is gone. You have low self-esteem. You don't even like yourself again. You look at yourself as you know, you don't, you don't, you are not worth anything. You're always trying to please everybody. You know, anything anybody tells you to do, you do it for them because you want them to appreciate you. You want to feel good because trauma, when we, when we try to manage trauma, we are trying to do things to make us feel good because inside of us, we don't feel good. We feel bad because we've been abused. So there's always that 
desire, that yearning that, what can I do? And so that's why some people even go to addiction. People, some people that have gone through trauma, they get addicted because maybe they, they, they can take something, they will feel high, they will forget the pain, they can do this one, they, they will forget the pain. So, and some people get, some people get addicted to people pleasing. Because every time they do something for somebody and people are happy, they say, oh, thank you so much. And that's the only time they feel good. And so they always, they go out of their way, even at the detriment of their own well-being, to do something for other people, just so they can hear, oh, wow, well done. So they feel good. So it's a fix for them. Listen, you don't have to be addicted to anything, to Emotion, emotional, uh, emotional words from people, substance or act or anything you are doing, you can get that satisfaction from your own inside. And it doesn't matter how long it has happened, right? You need to come to a place where you tell yourself, I will take myself through this journey of healing. It is a journey. <laughs> because I went through 16 years of domestic violence and abuse. I wouldn't think that one week I would be okay after. No, I had to commit and I'm still in the journey. I'm not there. I'm far away from where I came from, but I'm not there because it is a journey for me that I'm still on. And so you have to make up your mind that you want to go on that journey. Time. People just think that time will heal. So I was saying that when I had this operation, um, I had to keep going for dressing because I have a large scar on my shoulder, you know, uh, which I don't think uh, at the point I was like, okay, should I expose this you like no let me just leave you because even sometimes when i look at it in the mirror I'm like oh that's deep <laughs> you know i had to get get skin grabs from my leg to put on it because it was very deep i had to be going for treatment i couldn't say to myself oh let me just sit at home time we heal this wound time we heal it no it will have degenerated into something that only god knows what will have happened so you need to commit to the process of therapy and healing. And look, part of this I'm going to be doing tonight is I'm going to be giving people, um, so if you want to go for, if you want to, uh, if you want coaching and therapy, you've been through any kind of trauma, okay? Yes, somebody said, do you, do you ever heal? You can heal. That's why I say you need to be committed to it, okay? And the first step is to make the decision that you want to heal and get a therapy right so i have a, i have an offer that i'm going to be giving everybody that's watching us tonight okay on my one-on-one -on -one, uh coaching i'm going to be giving 20 percent discount but first i have a free clarity session for you if you go to my bio and click on the link there you can uh, get a, a slot for the free clarity session you've been through any kind of trauma and you need therapy you need healing you can go to my bio now and commit yourself yes my good evening pastor shala commit yourself to that journey of healing because healing is a gift that you give to yourself and so one other thing we go through this uh different kinds of trauma is it affects your interpersonal relationships i've seen people who are in a relationship relationship number one they were abused yes virtual relationship number one they were abused and then they come out of that abuse and they get into another relationship and they're abused again <laughs> It becomes a circle. And you're asking yourself, okay, you're asking, didn't this person let? No, that is because their mind has been conditioned to abuse. You will see that sometimes victims have what we call Stockholm Syndrome, where even um, organizations will go to help the, the, the victim out of the traumatic environment. And they will believe that, oh, we've, we've, we've taken you out. And then the next minute, that person finds their way back to the abuser because they believe that I cannot sustain, I cannot live without this abuser. That's what happens. Yes, I cannot live without this abuser. And it's because they've trained your mind. See, I say that the, the way an abuser starts to abuse you is first of all to start working on your mind. Your mind. Guard your heart with all diligence for out of it comes the issues of life. The, 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 the quality of your life is directly proportionate to the quality of your mind. How, how healthy is your mind? How healthy is your soul? How healthy is your will? How healthy is your emotions? Because look, when you are depressed, and I, and I experienced this, I was clinically depressed. When you are depressed, you know what to do, but you just can't get yourself to do it. So I know I should 
get up in the wake up in the morning go and take my bath but i'm just there lying down on the bed i can't be bothered I'd... because at that point in time your will is tired your will so remember you're so conscious of your will your mind and your emotions and because your will because your soul has been wounded it affects also your will your will is tired and so you need to commit yourself to going through that journey because it will affect your interpersonal relationship, it will affect your spiritual development, it will affect your self-worth, it will affect your self-esteem. Okay? And the truth is, you need to come to a place where you tell yourself that, look, I'm better than this. Okay? A lot of people think that they are not worth doing anything. I shared the story of, I love flowers. Uh, I just love having fresh, there's always fresh flowers, plants and everything around me. And, you know, in the early stages of my healing, I will go to the uh, to the supermarket and I will see flowers. I'll be like, oh, so nice. I wish somebody would buy me flowers. And one day, the Holy Spirit said to me, buy yourself the flowers. I'm like, uh-uh, no. Uh. Who, no, but who buys flowers for themselves? No, somebody needs to buy the flowers for me. <laughs> and I went back and forth. But by the time I left that store that day, I was I bought myself the flowers. And the feeling was, well, so it was like you deserve it you deserve something good for some of us over the, over the years even because as a child you feel that you don't deserve anything good they're always comparing you with your siblings and they're telling you that your siblings are better than you and so you've been starved of love you've been starved of affection you feel that you have to do something before you get love before you get affection and that's affected you even in your adulthood a lot of people are in relationships and marriages that are having issues because of the childhood trauma that you experience. You need to go through, through, through uh, therapy and detox yourself from that. A lot of people also compare themselves to other people. Low self-esteem. I'm talking about low self-esteem. You go on social media. <laughs> I see so, 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 so somebody lately that said, look, never believe what you see on social media. And it's the, tr it's the, it's the truth. Because you look at yourself and somebody has posted, oh, my, my lovely boo, my this, my that. And you are having challenges in your own relationship. And that is making you feel that something is wrong with you. Everybody's marriage is perfect. Nobody, no, everybody's trying. But you keep comparing yourself to other people and then you are telling yourself, I'm not good enough. That's why my life is not like that. And for some people, if somebody looks at you and says, oh, you have lovely, your hair is nice. <laughs> Which hair? <laughs> ah, which hair? This year, eh? <laughs> it was my auntie's grandma that left it for me when she died, though. The hair is old. Forget about the hair. She's always asking you a question. They just said your hair is fine. But because of low self esteem, you have trouble yeah. accepting positive feedback. And it affects the way you, are, you relate with people. Some, some people, they, they feel that. They feel that people are going to leave them. When you've gone through tra trauma, you have fear of rejection. That's why sometimes you see some people will call you, they'll call you once, you didn't, you didn't pick up a phone, they'll call you again. And you will look at your phone, you see 10 missed calls. <laughs> and then you call the person back. Ah, I've been calling you. What did you pick? Ah, and then they are panicking. And you're like, calm down. <laughs> What's going on? It's because there's, there's trauma in the life of this person somewhere where they have been rejected, where maybe a parent walked out on them, where a sibling walked out on them, where a, a loved one walked, somebody walked out on them. And so they feel that everybody that come into their life, they have to hold on to that person so that the person will not walk out on them. And this is, this also, you know, I, I, I was, when I was speaking um, last week, I was saying that we also need to help our children understanding the needs the soul needs of our children so when your child comes to you and wants to come and wants a hug don't say go 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 we are busy i'm busy i'm busy you are you are harming that child's esteem because you're saying to the child whatever i'm doing is more important than you and i know yes you, you might be busy but the truth is you can spare you can spare 30 seconds even if you're talking to somebody you can say oh, just hold on for me Oh, sweetie, I'll be with you in a minute. I'm just talking to I'm just in a meeting, you know, and all of that. Because, see, children, remember affection, attention, appreciation, love, and care. The more you, 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 you take those things away from a child, the more it's going to affect the upbringing 
of that child. And some people have grown up adults, but they didn't get all of this when they were growing up, and it's affecting them even now as an adult. So uh emotional wound uh inflicts on our mind our will and our, and our emotion and if you do not heal from what hurt you somebody say you will bleed on the person that did not cut you i'll say that again if you don't heal from what hurt you you will bleed on people who did not cut you so it's important for you to begin the journey of healing begin to tell yourself i need to discover myself i want to accept myself i want to love myself i remember my mom my biological mother looked at me many many years ago and said to me jola you don't love yourself <laughs> he said because i had also had issues with my children you know at that point in time i wasn't with my children and i was so <laughs> my mother said if you die your children will be okay or they will live their lives i had to come to a place where i start prioritizing my well-being and especially Especially if you're an empath, in fact, if you're an empath, I have a community for empaths. You need to also go to my bio, the information is there. If you're an empath, an empath is like a metal, and the narcissist is a magnet. You are just drawn to them because narcissism is one of the most deadly uh, pa uh, um, personality disorders that abusers have. And sadly, only about 3% of narcissistic personality disorders gets you know go through therapy and heal because one of their traits is they have an exaggerated opinion of their own importance so a narcissist believes that they are always right everybody else is wrong i mean how dare you tell me i need therapy there's nothing wrong with me you are the problem you are the one that needs help in fact if you go with a narcissist to, to a counselor and that counselor does not understand what narcissistic personality disorder is by the time you are leaving the counselor will begin to tell you, the victim, that, ah, you know, you are not doing well at all. Your behavior is not good. You need to do this, you need to do that. Because they will have wrapped the counselor around their finger because narcissists are intelligent people. They have charisma. And so if you don't understand, they will, they will so turn everybody. If they, in fact, I was, I was saying that, you know, if my ex talked to me about me and I was not me, I was going to hate me. I'd be like, ah, ah, you're not grace. Really? Ah, ah, hey, you're not a good person. No. Because they have a way with words. They will talk and turn and twist everything to make other people see you in a bad light. But one thing I say to people is don't worry. <laughs> don't you worry. One of the things that, you know, which I don't have time to, you know, to, to really go through and just share everything I would love to share is one of the things you need to do for yourself in your journey of loving yourself is to forgive those who hurt you you're not forgiving them because of them you're forgiving them because of you remember i talked about negative emotions trapped on your inside so when you're holding someone in unforgiveness and you remember the person there's a flashback you see the person you have all these negative emotions bitterness anger resentment and listen they can and degenerate into diseases in your body so coming to a place of forgiveness is you excelling and letting go and and just leaving them i'm a, I'm, I'm a christian and bible says vengeance is mine i will repay and one thing i say to people is see uh, character is smoke so let me say it in your but if anywhere so it will eventually come out and people will see it. You don't need to stress yourself about trying to say, ah, oh, no, I didn't know, I did. You don't need to. Just focus. Like mama used to say, focus on your focus. Focus. Just what you focus on expands. Some people have gone through abuse, they've gone through trauma, and all you focus and think of right now is the person that abused you, the person that hurt you. You just, what is he doing? What is he doing now? Ha, hey, hey. High blood pressure panic attack you are doing yourself a disfavor just focus on healing focus on finding yourself focus on loving yourself and forgive yourself yes i know you made a mistake i made a mistake i i made a wrong choice of a life partner but you are not your mistake you need to come to a place where you separate who you are from the events that happen to you nobody lives in an event so we have an event we we are doing this ig life now we're not going to be here like perpetually it's going to finish in about 10 minutes so what happened to you is an event 
So separate yourself from that event. I have to tell myself, yes, I made this mistake. I was naive, very naive. And so I said to myself, no, I am not my mistake. I know it is hard. <laughs> and I'm not telling you what I've been through, what I've not been through. It is hard, but you can do it. And by the grace of God, I say to people that, look, if you're thinking and you're wondering, how will I come out of this? Just look at my life. It is a testimony of what God can do. I sit sometimes and I'm crying, not because I'm sad, but because I'm so grateful. Thinking about where God brought me from to where I am today. Even sometimes me, I don't, I don't recognize myself. I'm like, Jola, is this you? <laughs> See how audacious I'm both. <laughs> Wow, wow. Ma. <laughs> I have questions and I want to spend the next 10 minutes. Amazing, usual. Amazing, amazing. Thank you so much. I can't you. even thank you enough. Fantabulous. Yes, I want yes. us to be able to, because people are asking you questions and uh, <laughs> you said we're not going to stay here for perpetually. So I want to answer this question. Someone I'm says. How, what should he do? How, how can she recover? How can she recover after one rape, two failed marriages, and then children to take care hmm. of? I think that's a question. Yes. How do I manage my mental health after one rape, two failed marriages? Hmm. With violence. Wow. With violence. Okay. My husband said to me, I'm like a waste of space. I wept bitterly that day. Um, okay. Want to answer that um, first? Right. So the Don't... first thing I'm going to say to you is, listen, you are not all of those things they are saying to you. You need to find out who you are and discover who you are. Right? I know it's hard and it's painful. I'm not, I'm not underestimating the pain that, you're, that you've experienced, but you can rise above that painful past. The first way to do this is to make a decision to rise. It all starts by making a decision. In fact, now let me start coaching you. I will say if you have pen and paper, take a, your pen and your paper and take an A4 paper and write, I will rise. I will rise. I am deciding to write, write it down because as you are writing, you're writing it in your subconscious. Sometimes I tell, I tell my clients to do funny things that they like. They say, ah, when I was writing this, I felt silly, but ah, it really, it really made a lot of difference. Because something else has been written in your subconscious all this time. Now you need to come to a place and tell yourself, mm -mm, I'll make the decision to rise. You can rise above your past because your past is your past. This is the present. And you have a glorious future. And it's your yes, book. Mark. So on the book Amazon? is on Amazon. The book is also available. Ma? Okay, okay. rise above your past. The title. Jola Grace Emmanuel. It's a powerful book. Yeah. I have my copy right And Mama did the room. commendation, so. <laughs> okay. Yeah, another question. Thank you very much. In a situation where both spouses have issues on small things, and the husband decides to stop talking to you for a month, okay. what should be done? Um, I would also <laughs> say you need to seek therapy, seek counseling, right? Because one of the things I said to myself when I started practicing as a therapist and coach is, God, I don't want to counsel people from my own pain. Because I realized that um, people are different. Each individual situation is different. So it might be that is a toxic situation. It might be that it is not a toxic situation. There was somebody that came for counseling and the person wanted out of the marriage. And by the time we went, I took the person through 12 weeks of uh, self-esteem reconstruction. And by the time she finished that session, she did not do anything. I did not talk to the husband, but the husband changed automatically because she changed. She now found her esteem. She now began to love herself. People treat you the way you treat yourself. So I have different packages. I have the self-esteem reconstruction package. I have the soul healing package, different packages, you know, childhood uh, uh, trauma, healing from your childhood trauma. You can just read all the information is in my bio. Uh, you can go and get it. Okay. That's, that's a handle. That's Coach Jola Grace. I've pinned it. What do I do when my husband is insecure? Um, again, seek, 
sick coaching, sick counseling, sick therapy. Um, um, again, what do you mean by insecure? Because listen, the, something I said is you cannot control what other people do. You can only control what you do. So a lot of times I say to people, you focus on you, on developing you, understanding you, right? Prioritizing you because we train people to train us by the way we, we relate with ourselves. So if I can't set boundaries in my life, if I can't, you know, come to a place where I stay, no, where I say I would not, I say to people that abuse tolerated becomes aggravated. Nobody just abuses you and beats you up one day. It starts little by little. If the first time they told, tell you that you are stupid and they say, no, please do not talk to me like that. I, will not, I, don't, I don't appreciate to be spoken to like that. The person would, you know, began to, I know people who have told me that initially at the early stage of their marriages, the man wanted to hit that. They said, don't try it. Don't even think about it. And today they are, they are blissful marriages. So how are you treating yourself? Let's start from inside of you. Okay. okay. Are you going to say something about empaths? Some quick tips on how to cope with a narcissist. I think I handled this some time ago when I brought Mr. Adesuba. Do you want to say something? So I Are think one of the person? first things an empath needs to do is first of all understand where you are on the spectrum. So because they are you have a full blown empath, you have a, a strong empath, you have a low key empath. You may not know where you are on that spectrum, right? You need to be in a community that will help you because as empaths, it's very difficult for you to say no. It's very difficult for you to set boundaries. You, you are just there to meet. Sometimes, oftentimes, empaths have what we call savior mentality. You believe that I, I'm here to save the whole world, <laughs> even though I'm not Jesus. So you need, one of the things you need to do to learn to do is to set boundaries. It can be difficult, but you can do it. And if you are accountable to somebody, we know that, okay, all of you, you are here. So I said I have a community, uh, you know, which we do group coaching, and it's specifically for empaths. You can join. The link is in my bio. That one is just £100 every month in that, uh, for that community. And we meet every week. We put ourselves on task, on assignment. We hold ourselves accountable. So you can join that community because it's not something you can just do on your own. Because by nature, and it's a good thing, it's actually a gift. Those that profess should prophesy. Those that serve should serve. Those that help should help. It's a gift. But if you don't know how to enhance it, you will self sabotage. Okay. What about if the person still resides with you, like okay. your wife? So the man is speaking here. So the, the truth is, um, in some instances, if you understand what you're dealing with, you can manage that relationship. In some instances, especially if there's physical abuse involved, you need to get, get out, out, out. Like mommy used to say, mommy told my dad something. Mommy said, the covenant of life is superior to the covenant of marriage. <laughs> and for me, I think that was one of the things that my dad, my, my dad said, I'd rather have a divorced daughter than a dead daughter. So if there's physical abuse involved, out, out, out. But also, if, you know, there are some other things that you feel that, that's why we, all, we always want to assess these things individually. Come and talk to us and let us look at it and say, okay, is this something that you can actually assess? Is it sometimes, if it's not, it's not gone too deep, you can begin to set boundaries, you can begin to do things that would make, because it, it takes two, it always takes two. That's why I say to you, it always takes two. You can't fight, you can't fight alone. Somebody, the other person has to participate. And if I put my foot down and I say no, I put some things in place and I say no. The other person will adjust themselves. So let's talk, you know, send me a message and let's talk. Let's assess the situation uh, uh, as an individual case. Okay, another person says you can forgive, but how do you get back the intimacy when you have to keep living hmm. with the person? Now, I would, I would want to assume that this person is talking about maybe this person has abused you. I don't know what, you know, you're forgiven. Um, because if it's an issue of abuse, the truth is getting back intimacy is is almost it, it, except the other person goes through therapy. And I'm I'm not saying that abusers cannot go through therapy and heal. Because for some people, there it's not a personality disorder. I've dealt with a guy who has who who who, who grew up seeing his father abuse his mother, and this guy kept saying to himself, "I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do this to my wife." But because your brain cannot process negative, negative, when you say, I will not beat my wife, what will happen is your brain will delete the not. I will beat my wife. And so when a situation presents itself and you are in conflict with your spouse, 
the what is already engraved in your mind just comes to play automatically so that person after it happens the person of course will be remorseful and say and the person actually saw therapy i don't want to do this but i lived with it growing up the person went through the process of therapy and the person was restored back you know to their spouse so depending on what situation you're going through if the person agrees to go through therapy because you can't be healing i mean doing all the work and the person is not doing anything Right? It's going to be very difficult to get any kind of intimacy or relationship going back. It has to be both parties come together and say, okay, we want to make this work. Go through therapy, I'll go to therapy, and then we can begin to build. Again, give yourself time, be patient. Be patient with yourself and begin to build back little by little, little by little. Okay, thank you so very much. You know, I promised you that I will bring back all my guests. So, I'm <laughs> thank you, I man. promise gradually. Thank you so much. And I brought back Jola. That's, what can I do? My husband and in-laws are trying to cover his abuse towards me by hiding in church and telling people that I have mental health issues. He curses at me all the time. Oh. I'm sure we cannot even answer this question. Can you reach out to her? I have pinned, you know, her handle. <laughs> I'm so sorry. It's time. Once again, I want to say big. I know we have different issues. We have different questions. Oh. Wow. Oh, oh. Okay. I'm sorry. Therapy, can you please reach out to Coach Jola Grace? That's her handle. You'll be able to send her an email and then she'll be able to have time Thank for you. you. So much, Thank Mommy. you so very I'm much so for doing this. I'm deeply, deeply grateful that honored. Thank you, man. Shit. Thank you for being a blessing. You were such a blessing at any chance can meet him in London. And I decided to just bring you, bring you up, you know. Yeah. God bless you. Stop crying. Oh. Yeah. Reach out to him. Reach out to Jola Grace. You are one of the things why God raised her. Thank everybody from different parts of the world for being a part of this. I appreciate you. I'll see you next week, Tuesday, by God's grace. Please have a fantastic Thank you, man. Fantastic Good evening, ma'am. Bye, ma'am. Love you. Bye. I'm going to post this on my Instagram page for like two days and after that i will move it to my youtube channel it's saved thank you everybody bye, -bye.